Let's talk about faith, hope, and love. This came up through the studies that I've been doing on faith in Hebrews 11. And I came across this trio. Um, not that we haven't come across them before, but came across this and realized they are a trio. They are tightly knit. And there is a couple of places in Scripture I wanted to call your attention to. It's my intent that this be brief. I'll say briefly. 1 Corinthians 13 is the first place that we really have a clear statement that they're a trio, that they go together. In the 8th verse down through the 10th verse. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we currently know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect thing has come, the partial thing will pass away. As an illustration, he goes on in the 10th verse. In the 11th verse, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. We currently see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face. I know in part at the moment, but at that time I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. But the 13th verse is the one, the target verse here. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So the first thing that he's saying here is there's no end to love. When we say love never fails, we don't mean people never act in a way that isn't loving <laughs> um, or that people who once loved us will always love us. That's not what it means. It means it's never going to cease to be a thing. Love will always be with us. It's, that's always something that is part of the world um, and part of life, that there is going to be this thing called love. But prophecies, well, they will pass away. And tongues, that is to say, the miraculous ability to speak foreign languages, will cease. And knowledge, that is the miraculous ability to know things, things that are beyond your actual knowledge but God grants to you, that also will pass away. These are what we have called the spiritual gifts. They are things that God gave to the church at a time when the Bible was not yet complete. That's why he gave the illustrations that he did, saying that, you know, we know in part, we prophesy in part, meaning prophecy or spiritual gifts supplement what we already know. But when the complete thing comes, the perfect thing comes, then the partial will be done away. Well, which partial will be done away? The knowledge or the prophecy? Obviously the prophecy. When the, the fullness of the revelation is here, when the Bible is complete, we don't need the prophecies anymore. We don't need the tongues anymore. We don't need miraculous knowledge because all the knowledge and everything that there is to say um, will be in the Bible. That's what Paul was telling them at Corinth at that time. Of course, you and I live in a time where we have the Bible. We have the complete, the perfect. It has come. So the prophecies, they're not around anymore. The tongues, they're not around anymore. Mir miraculous knowledge, they're not around anymore. We don't need them. People say, I've got this tongue speaking. No, you don't. First of all, you don't. I know you don't because 1 Corinthians 14 regulates it very well, and that's not even close to what you're doing. But secondly, because of 1 Corinthians 13, tongues will cease. What are you going to say in a foreign language that the Bible doesn't already say? Well, nothing. It's already been recorded. It's already been revealed. There's no reason for a tongue to be moved by the Holy Spirit today when the pen has already been moved by the Holy Spirit. 
But when he says love never ends, he's saying it's always here. And by the way, as long as we're talking about the prophecies, the spiritual things go away, people say, well, when that which is perfect, that's heaven. When the world is over and heaven is here. Ah, but the problem with that is the 13th verse says, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. They're going to stay. Well, there won't be faith in heaven. There won't be hope in heaven. These things are always here. That is, here is earth. (laughs) While we are in this life, there will always be faith and hope and love. But the greatest of these is love, because faith will disappear in heaven. Faith is that belief in the unseen. But when you're in heaven, you see God. You behold him face to face. There's no faith in that. Hope. Why does one hope for what he sees? Paul said in Romans 8. That's not hope. Hope is not seen. Why does somebody hope for what he sees? That's not hope. But love is the greatest because in heaven there will be love. (laughs) That is true. One thing is eternal and that is love. Um, so it's the greatest thing in part for this reason it's the thing that really is permanent faith, hope, and love are with us always but love is eternal and God, we love because he first loved us and yeah I can't help but chuckle. I think about some of those, uh, some really bad translations that travelers turn in. Somebody said, our, our resort will leave you nothing to hope for, you know, <laughs> which that's funny. But I understand what they meant, as in everything will be realized. There, there won't be anything left out that you're just hoping for. It'll be, I know what they meant, you know. That's the same thing here. You don't need hope in heaven. There's nothing to hope for. You have everything. Now, 1 Thessalonians is the other place that I would go. I would go, but my thumbs are letting too many pages through. There you go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, for example, says in the second through the fifth verses, We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. The apostles know that Thessalonica, the Christians at Thessalonica, are the real deal. God has chosen them. And the reason they know this, as he said, They remember the third verse. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. And I just have to realize, you know, here's another Greek city-state. Corinth is one, Thessalonica is one, and we have another trio of faith and hope and love. These have come together. And the application that the apostle makes is we, when we pray to God, we give thanks for you because we remember these things. You had a work of faith. 
a labor of love, a steadfastness of hope. We know He has chosen you. Our gospel came not only in word, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction, meaning they received the word of God. And there's more to talk about with regard to this word of God being received among them. It's actually a very lengthy lesson, but you may recall the quotation in Acts, uh, in Acts 17 that said the Bereans were more noble because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Um, well, that's in reference to the Jews in Thessalonica who were less noble because they rejected these words and ran off the apostles who ran to Berea. And on arrival, they found that the Jews who were in Berea were more noble-minded noble instead of cutting them off, shutting them up, kicking them out of town, they actually searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. But there were some at Thessalonica who did believe the gospel. And you know, if they treated the apostles that way, things were not real comfortable for the Christians in Thessalonica. In fact, that's the place where they uh, dragged Jason out into the town square and they took a security pledge from him, you know, mob justice, which is, does not exist, right? Um, that's why he says, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. It was under those circumstances that these people believed. And in their belief, he found a work of faith, a labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope that got stuck in his brain. And he remembers that when he prays, and therefore he's giving thanks for them when he prays. So it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good little triplet here, this faith, love, and hope. But finally, in the fifth chapter of the same letter, they make another appearance. where he says, starting in the fifth verse, you're all children of light, children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Because God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. We belong to the day, he said. And since we belong to the day, we don't live in the things that are of the darkness. The sins that he talks about here, but they're just typical of a life that doesn't have the light of the gospel of Christ in it. But our sobriety in the Spirit is um, fronted by putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. We have, help, we have faith and love and hope. The breastplate, of course, guards the heart. The helmet guards the mind, for those of us who have one. And faith and love and hope are working together here for the complete protection of the child of God, you know, who goes forth to do spiritual battle in the day. And as he said, we do this because God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. The intent of God is that we 
start to live for him. He, he didn't do this so that we would be lost or destroyed. He did this so that we would be saved. We belong to the day. Let us be sober. Let us be ready for battle with, with the protection. You notice these things that we have, the breastplate and the helmet, they're protection. Although there is a sword, which is the Spirit of God, in another passage, it's not this passage. In this passage, the only things mentioned are defensive. And that defense is because God did not destine us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. Through our Lord Jesus, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. The reason why it focuses on the protection that is in faith, hope, and love is that God has not destined us for wrath. He intends for us to be saved. Now, I understand that there's things that I can do that will mess that up and take that salvation away from me. I understand that, but it's not God's intent. What he wants is for me to be saved and you to be saved, for all of us to be saved. And so he's given us the protection that is faith and hope and love. And the great thing about these faith, hope, and love that's better than a breastplate and better than a shield is these three abide. They will always be here. I might go without, you know, other protections. I might go without friends. I might go without money. I might go without food. But... I'll never go without faith, hope, and love. Those will always be available. You will be protected in the Spirit. He destined us for salvation. He wants us to live for Him. He died for us that we might live with Him. And that's the idea of the, the defense. And you look back at that first chapter the apostles remembering them, he said, we know that you're chosen, that God has chosen you. How does he know? Because of that, that faith, that hope, that love, the work, the labor, the steadfastness that they have. It tells them, these guys are, they're in the hands of God. They belong to him. And the Lord does know those who are his. So, won't you live for him, would be the next question. He wants us to be saved, but of course we have a lot to do with that, whether we will believe in him, whether we will repent, whether we will obey him, that's up to us. He has given us his word. He's done the overwhelming majority of the work. The hard thing is to get forgiveness of sins. And Jesus did this by dying for us, by giving himself up and being resurrected from the dead, proving that God can turn anything around. If in our lives we have not been living right, we've got to repent and come to him in obedience. And yes, in belief, but part of that belief is that he can turn this around. It can be different. He has the power to do that. He has the power to raise the dead. Today, are you uh, uh, in need of obedience to the gospel of Jesus? Are you, uh, uh, have you been baptized in the name of Christ Jesus for forgiveness of sins? We, we have made arrangements with a hotel to have water available for any that need to obey the gospel of Jesus. Today, are you a Christian, but maybe have not lived right? Let us help you with our prayers. Steal your resolve. Think about Thessalonica and how they were sure of their salvation and how they could rely on the defense of God who intends for us to be saved and, and take comfort in that. But if you haven't lived right, well, make it right. And let us pray with you and for you so that we can go back to that place of comfort in the Spirit and in the Lord. 
If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.